the Tall Corn Book Talk. I'm Nick Burgess, and with me, as always, is Steve Semkin, the publisher of Ice Cube Press. <laughs> I write the Shelf Life column for the Iowan Magazine. Mm -hmm. We get together uh, quarterly, discuss yeah. books, and invite somebody fun to come and talk with us. So let's start right. with uh, right off with some recommendations. Mm -hmm. Steve, what do you what do you want to start with today? Well, it's a busy season. I don't read a lot because you know if you could see me read, it would be like three minutes. Oh, I missed that page. It's very slow reading for me, but I do have some uh, recommendations. Uh, a lot of them, this one is Native Soulmate, uh, Season in Search of a Love Homegrown. It's kind of a follow-up to when we had Zachary Jack in and yeah. we did What Cheer. Yeah. And that was his, um, his novel about going out to find love in Iowa. And this is what really happened when he went out. And so he ends up at 4-H uh, fairgrounds and he ends up at libraries and in some ways, the most popular crowd for him is 70-year-old uh, women, of course, who come in and say, well, my daughter's daughter just came back to town. Maybe you could go out with her. <laughs> and, and a lot of it's like that, but a lot of it's his opinions on, uh, on how it is to find love in, rural, in the rural Midwest. And it's not as simple as just brain drain. Yeah. Um, and what inspired him is just that he's a fifth-generation Iowan farmer, and he's like the first person in his family that hasn't found a, a husband or a wife just within where he lives. Sure. And so he's like, I'm going to go out and figure out why this is done. And it's got a good ending. He actually finds somebody. Along the way, you're like, Zach, what were you thinking? And, and is, some, this, is this fiction or nonfiction? This is nonfiction. So he really does. So this really is what happened to him when he was out on, the, out on his wife quest. That's great. And that's, so that's on the on your imprint, on your, your Zachary right, right. Michael. This is a uh, Zach, Ice Cube yeah, Press yeah. Um, tall corn book. Right, which is all his books right now, right? Right, 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 right. We'll yeah. eventually get some non-Zachary Michael Jack books on that imprint. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's called, it's just about um, rural Iowa issues right, right. and stuff, tall corn country. Right. right. I did want to mention um, uh, Ingrid Hill, who is mm -hmm. a local author. She's actually mm -hmm. part of the congregation. We We shoot these shows in the big white house and oh, right. she is uh, part of that congregation that, that runs that house mm -hmm. um, and she's working on a book that features the big white house and um, oh, I haven't read it but I'm, I'm it's going to be a big book it is going to be a <laughs> big book. book it's called Wind <laughs> Widows and, and Orphans mm -hmm. and uh, but I am told that in her version mm -hmm. the big white house is actually a big blue house but um, I'm always sort of intrigued by by because I live in Iowa <laughs> City you know you get uh, you get uh, sort of places and people from Iowa City in a lot of, of well-written books. And it's just always right. interesting to see how, how craftsmen right. sort of change those, those settings and those, those people. Right. Well, making it the big blue house, it's not a major stretch of the imagination. But, <laughs> no, it's not. It's just a big you know, job. It's a primary color. That's right. It's not. <laughs> well, what else do you have for us? Um, I've got one uh, called Becoming Real that just came out with Ice Cube Press by a longtime uh, Kirkwood instructor, Bob Sessions, here at, uh, in Iowa City for 26 years. Mm -hmm. and, um, it's called Authenticity in an Age of Distraction is the uh, subtitle and at first you think man does that sound like a yawner because <laughs> he was an old philosophy instructor but the cool thing about the book is that it's he purposely takes experiences in his own life mm -hmm. and just tries to examine why it's so hard these days with computers taking over and internet and Twitter and just to step back and kind of re-examine what we can do to not lose ourselves along the way and he takes into account um, philosophy, so in some ways you're reading it going, wow, I'm learning about philosophy, but I'm learning about his camping trips, and I'm also learning about experiences of him raising children. And, and um, he's got a section on nature and also one on calling, which the, the idea of calling is really pretty interesting. It doesn't have to be a religious thing so much. It's just um, everyone seems to have a gift, and it's important to stay with that and understand what that is. And it, So he examines issues like that. And he has been in Iowa City for a long time, and his wife is uh, Lori Erickson, who a lot of mm -hmm. people know for um, her children's books and other travel books that she's done. She also writes for the Iowan. And she uh, writes for the Iowan magazine. She does. A great magazine. All the authors mm -hmm. are brilliant. Uh, people that write <laughs> right. for that. Um, I also want to mention, this, this will tie in a little bit later. Um, mm -hmm. I went back and reread a little bit of Truman, Truman Capote's uh, uh, In Cold Blood, which mm -hmm. uh, when we get, we get into Brother's Blood, lots of blood, uh, later, we'll we'll really tie into that. It's a right. it's just a it's a phenomenal book, and it's one of those one of the first pieces of nonfiction that I really sank my teeth into and right, really right. enjoyed. Right, yeah, that one's nonfiction. I've just got um, a couple more. I'll just Great. squeeze in real quick. Uh, I think we talked about Train to Nowhere before, but this is one by Ice Cube Press, mm -hmm. and um, this has been on Iowa Public Television as a documentary, yeah. and it's 
The reason I mention it now is it's going to be replayed again this month and in, in the next um, six weeks. And so if you watch that documentary and you're like, you know, I want to know just a little bit more or I want to know who she interviewed or a little yeah. bit more, here you go, you can find out more. There's also a giant version of that book on Clinton Street in oh, right. the city. You can go read the first paragraph <laughs> in like six foot letters. <laughs> and yeah. It's so big, it's part of the City of Literature yeah. bookmark program. Okay. So I just thought I'd throw that out real quick and you can get that anywhere. And then. Uh, I noticed you mentioned it when I first came in. You have a picture book with you? I love picture books. And, <laughs> well, uh, I did this one this year. It's a picture book by a lady in um, Sioux City, Iowa, and an artist in uh, Dubuque, Iowa. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of cool to do picture books. It surprises me. There's not that many words, but the author's just like, I don't know. Should I make it that word or not? And I thought, <laughs> boy, people that write long works of fiction, if they spent that much time on every single word, they'd never be done. They'd be sitting there typing, they ch, 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 wait, yeah. I gotta change. Ch. They'd never get done. But it's got a lot of cool color pictures oh, yeah, in it. Great. And, you know, it's vibrant, and you've got a kid who wants to fulfill his dreams and has to, it's, it's a good combination of, uh, yeah. It's part of the um, process. It's um, Jim Davis runs this Iowa writing mm -hmm. project at Cedar Falls. Mm -hmm. And so Jeanette does a lot of work with that on education and counting and um, sound words. So in reality, there is a lot more going on in here Very than cool. a lot of us put together. And that's Great. called The Juggler with Jeanette Hopkins and Stormy Mokel. Great. And uh, it's available in bookstores now. Well, cool. All what right, else do you think, have for us? Uh, I think that's about it. it. All right. Yeah. Well, let's, uh, let's introduce uh, Scott, and uh, we're going to talk yeah, about his book, guess. which, is, which yeah. is Brother's Blood, um, which is a true story, sort of as, as we said, in the vein of, of In Cold Blood. Right. Um, Scott's going to talk a little, take us through, through this mm -hmm. three-decade-old right. true crime, nonfiction book about uh, right. joyous a story it's about a, family killing. Right. It's a brave story for someone to tell, I yeah. believe. Well, we're really happy to uh, have Scott uh, mm -hmm. Coelty, which I think I got right, maybe. We'll see, mm -hmm. um, with us today to talk about his new book, which is, which is Brother's Blood, um, a, a Heartland, Cain, and Abel. Mm -hmm. um, Scott, why don't you give us sort of a little bit about uh, what, what is the book about? Well, in 1975, Jerry Mark, who I, I graduated from high school with Jerry Mark, 1961 mm -hmm. I graduated, he graduated in 60. And uh, in 1975, he rode back from Berkeley, California on his Honda 450 motorcycle, mm. not a big bike, right. no and Harley's. killed his brother, his brother's wife, and their two children. Uh, one, uh, the girl was five, Julie was five, and Jeff was just 21 months in their beds. Uh, this was Halloween night, 1975. Mm. Uh, Jerry was an all-American boy, a lawyer, a Peace Corps volunteer, a 4-H leader. And uh, one of those all-around guys that you think is going to be a massive success in the world. He graduated vice president of his senior class. Mm -hmm. And so we were all floored when he was arrested for the crime 10 days after it occurred. And uh, it absolutely uh, seemed crazy to me that he could be arrested for it or that he would do it, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the more the evidence began leaking out, the more most of us realized, well, something was going on there. And in 1976, he was convicted of the four crimes and has been in Fort Madison ever since. So the, it was just one of those crimes that stirred everybody because first of all, it was a terrible crime for, for innocent yeah, no people. Kidding. And second, it was done by somebody who was one of us. It wasn't the drifters mm -hmm. right. of the Clutter family in, mm -hmm. in uh, Kansas. It was, this was one of, our, one of our own who was destined for greatness. And right. instead he turned to the dark side and he became a monstrous killer. Not exactly a serial killer, but a family right. killer. That's why Cain and Abel is appropriate. Right, right, right. Totally. Um, I want to talk a little bit about sort of your process of uh, going through and uh, researching and writing this, because what you've tried to do is, is reconstruct the mm -hmm. event. It's not it's not right. a news report. It's mm -hmm. it's a reconstruction of, mm -hmm. of from the time before he even mm -hmm. sort of premeditates this. And right. Drives out. Yeah, I, uh, I, I discovered uh, in, in 2006 that there was still a lot of controversy about whether he was guilty or not. Yeah, Judge O'Brien of the 8th eighth, eighth, eighth Federal District Court said he should get a new trial or be set free, and that mm -hmm. propelled me back into the story. I, I wasn't actually going to do much with it, but I realized it was hot, it was live, it was a real story still. So that's when I began pulling out all the research I had done in 1980, 
mm-hmm. when, it, when right after his first appeal, he was declaring him, uh, himself innocent mm-hmm. and threatened to kill himself by jumping over the walls of the penitentiary in Fort huh. Madison. And uh, he said they're going to have to shoot me because I'm an innocent man. It's civil disobedience. I have no business in prison. I was framed, etc. Mm-hmm. So at that point, I began my research in 1980. It took a lot of notes when I interviewed him in prison. I insisted on his innocence that he should have taken the stand to tell his story. Um, then I interviewed his mother, who also said he was innocent mm-hmm. and was it's terrible injustice, a miscarriage of justice. Right. Uh, David Dutton. I interviewed all these people and kept notes and transcripts. And then I collected the trial transcripts and the police Mm -hmm. interviews. I had a pile of stuff in boxes all around my study. And they just sat there for a long time through two moves. (laughs) And then in 2006, um, I began thinking, this story needs to be told. It's really still there. Mm -hmm. And I began pouring through the material. And I started writing it as a novel because I didn't want to worry about taking real people and putting words in their mouths. I think right. there's something very iffy about that. Right. So I wrote it as a novel, a four-part novel. I think you mm-hmm. read parts yeah, of it. Yeah. Of it. Right. yeah, And it didn't work. Uh, it was kind of interesting to write because I could let my imagination go. But right. people would see through that, too. Mm-hmm. They said, well, so where's Jerry in this and what's real? And what? They wanted to know right, what's right. real and what's not real. Right. Right. I mean, people want to know what happened. I mean, right. I, I always think, like, just... Of course, at the time when you were in high school, you didn't realize that he right. had this potential. But I think yes. back on my life, I've never, I've never known someone that killed anyone before. Yeah. And so right. I think part of why it's so fascinating is that someone like you, you almost feel tricked by this guy. It's like, I had full confidence in him. Yep. And then you look back on it and you think, how, I mean, obviously, how could he do that? But you yep. almost feel like mm-hmm. you want to say, no, he couldn't have done it, but you would have to tell mm-hmm. yourself. I mean, it's just that. I don't know, it feels like I would, I'd be tricked somehow. I would never get really over it entirely. He wouldn't have talked to me in Fort Madison had I not agreed to uh, listen to him and tell right. his side of the story. Exactly. He was trying to find a way out of prison. Right. And he was hoping I would help him by writing the truth about right. what happened. And so exactly. I listened and tried to, tried to make a decision. Right. I, I had read the trial transcripts. <laughs> right. The evidence Going is into. just overwhelming. Oh, and I brought absolutely. that up, and I said, Jerry, I, why didn't you take the stand? And he said, my lawyer told me I shouldn't. And mm-hmm. I checked with his lawyer, who said, I told him if he didn't take the stand, he was going to be convicted. Right. So he lied. You know, he, The right. thing we find about, there are two, two traits about him I discovered. He's mm-hmm. extremely articulate and intelligent mm-hmm. and persuasive. Right. He, can, he could talk his way out of anything. Right. He learned to do that. It turns yeah. out. <laughs> and the second thing is he lies all the time. He lies about everything. Right. Uh, probably a pathological liar as, as well as a sociopath. So um, you can't trust him. You can't believe anything he says. Plus, he probably believes he's always right. I mean, yep. the best con man is exactly. probably someone that fully believes he's telling you the truth exactly. at the same time that he's lying or she's lying to you. Right. Right. Yep. That's the kind of person he was. So uh, his girlfriend at the time, Mimi Marilyn Forrest, uh, really really wasn't sure. She told the police that, you know, mm-hmm. the timing wasn't quite right, that pistol, that revolver, oh, sorry, right. revolver disappeared. Mm-hmm. And then the motorcycle trip, and then the calls, the phone calls weren't quite right, at the timing. Right. So she was scared of him. And then when right. she came, uh, she met him in Nevada, when he came back mm-hmm. on the motorcycle, uh, he persuaded her that, how could you ever think my brother, I mean, he was grieving, and he was mourning, right. he was, he put on a real show. And it made it appear that he was absolutely innocent, and he's been he's been so shocked ever since that police would come and get right. him. And, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's absolutely. I mean, this is me thinking it over. Like, I didn't live in Cedar Falls, but I'm still captivated by it. <laughs> I mean, the mind of this kind of person, why his fiance or wife would be interested in him that much. Mm-hmm. So I just think to myself, anybody. I mean, you have all this CSI investigation right. now, and you have reality TV, mm-hmm. and this is exactly what this is, except yeah, it's right. even more um, in-depth, and so yeah. you're going to get a lot more out of it by reading something like this. Yeah. And Steve, mm-hmm. when you were, before this, the book was published, uh, right. and I know you guys were working on this, you mm-hmm. mentioned to me a couple of times that, that you were a little nervous about about publishing it. Can you talk a little bit about um, why you were? Um, well, I mean, I don't really have any good reasons. I mean, I guess I just thought, um, I don't know. <laughs> when I think of writing about someone that's still alive and in prison, I guess I just immediately thought, ah, just yeah. the thought of someone that can kill someone that's still alive, mm-hmm. that scares me a little bit. Mm-hmm. But 
when I really thought it through, I thought, no, I mean, I should be okay. I, I'm sure they have guards there. <laughs> guards with guns. <laughs> and, and that's okay. I, my name isn't Steve Simkin anyway, so yeah. I'd be impossible to find. Yeah. Wait, yeah. yes, it is. Turn it. Um, I don't know. I was just a little nervous about it. Not, I mean, if you would ask me 20 years ago what yeah. kind of book would I be doing, I was really into environmental studies. Yeah. And I never thought that I would um, get the, I guess, even the, the excitement of doing a book like this is actually pretty exciting to have a book like this come out mm -hmm. from now that it's out and I was working on it, mm -hmm. reading it. I've probably read the book, oh, maybe, not, probably not as many times as Scott has, obviously, or some people that have <laughs> read it along the ways, but I've read it like four or five times now. Mm -hmm. And it's completely captivating to me. And yeah. I realize that telling um, a story like this is worth other people knowing about, absolutely yeah. knowing this sort of thing for the city of Cedar Falls, for Iowa, and for people that are interested in this sort of thing. So I overcame yeah. my fear. And I was happy that the book provides a wider context because, well, thanks mm -hmm. for publishing it, first of all. Yeah, well, it was but also, good. David Dutton, thanks to David Dutton, the prosecutor, became a special prosecutor for this case and focused on it for six months. Mm -hmm. uh, he wrote a preface, mm -hmm. uh, and a right. forward, I should say. And then Tom Ruxlow, mm -hmm. who was the lead investigator, also wrote a right. brief forward. Actually, and then, that, yeah. that did actually give me more confidence in the book, only because... Yeah. It's like, it's nice to know you have those people on yeah. your side from That's the beginning, right. mm -hmm. from the storytelling point, but also from the author yeah. and the publisher point yeah. of view. Yeah, and something I've actually never seen before, the George and Margaret Coulthurst, mm -hmm. the mother, mother and right. father of the slain woman, Georgine Coulthurst, mm -hmm. wrote a victim's impact statement. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I'd like you to write something. I wasn't sure what it was. And he, he said, well, I'll write what we felt about it. And this is the kind of thing they would have said at the trial mm -hmm. right. had they been allowed in 1976 to do that. Right. That's a challenge. very raw right. statement of uh, anger and I was going to say, I challenge anyone to read that and not um, yeah. have chills go through them because sure, yeah. you were no question that this event happened when you finished yeah. reading that. Mm -hmm. yeah. No question at all. Yeah. Did you ever have misgivings about about writing it and, and researching it? Oh, for sure. Uh, first of all, I didn't I didn't continue with it because he was going through appeal after appeal mm -hmm. after appeal, four or five appeals, and these appeals were a big deal. I mean, he yeah. took mm -hmm. them before federal courts, and the judges looked it all over and said no. Then I thought, well, maybe I could write. Then, then another one was gearing up. There'd be some more, maybe mm -hmm. DNA, DNA evidence, right. neutron activation analysis was analyzed. The mm -hmm. lead uh, was disallowed. So mm -hmm. there was always some little technicality that was uh, kept coming up. Mm -hmm. And had the book come out when it, before this last appeal, there would have been reason for him to say, wait a minute, there's a book on that. I can't get a fair shake now. People read the book and they know they think I'm guilty. That's true. So that was right. a problem. This affects real. These books right. affect real people because yeah, they're exactly. out there living. The older brother Dick is still alive. Right. Uh, the lawyer who was disbarred for the Vibem at the end is still alive. Uh, mm -hmm. Bill Sinclair, right. the family lawyer. Mm -hmm. So it affects people to read this. Their names are in there, and they're right. I yeah. guess yeah. There's a lot of. I mean, that's why when we first came, I said I think it's a really brave story to tell on your part. I mean, <laughs> yeah. well, I don't know. I would have the nerve to to do it only because for the reasons you just said. I mean, I feel like yeah. it has to be told and someone has yeah. to do it and I'm just glad that you were the one well, to do yeah, it. Yeah, you know, I'm the messenger. I didn't. Right. I mean, I realize <laughs> they do shoot you're just, messengers. You're telling the story of what those people did. It's oh, public right. knowledge. That's right. It's not like yeah. you're making it up. But yeah. still, yeah. you become sort of the, mm -hmm. the rallying point. Well, an important feature of the mm -hmm. book, there are two mm -hmm. things we did to kind of mollify this issue or did mm -hmm. make this issue a little less uh, hot. Mm -hmm. uh, we got a, I found a lawyer in Cedar Rapids, Glenn Johnson, who right. read the book and then wrote a disclaimer. He said, these mm -hmm. are the kinds of things you should have, and the disclaimer's in the book twice. Right. And that's good. And then there's a sources section. If you, if you wonder how much I made up, half the book is sources. Yeah. The right. trial transcripts, the newspaper stories, the, uh, the interviews. And so you can read that and say, well, that's, that's there. Right? That you cannot deny right. that's the reality. Right. And uh, the stuff that I made up is in the right. first part. I would, be, I would think, it's a, I think it's a stretch to even say you made it up personally. I mean, <laughs> I think that um, if you read the sources, and I mean, I think that's how everyone tells a story to mm -hmm. a certain extent. I, think I mean, that's right, yeah. I don't believe, I mean, people are getting the story of what happened, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know we were going to talk about fiction, nonfiction, yeah. and whatnot. See, so maybe you can ask that question. I think it's great. I mean, this, um, is, this is labeled as, as nonfiction. Absolutely. Or, yes, as nonfiction. Mm -hmm. um, and, and yet, you, you do delve into sort of dreams, which clearly, mm -hmm. clearly that's not in the court record. No. Um, right. These these conversations <laughs> around a dinner table, which uh, many of the participants participants yeah. are are dead, yeah. um, or or wouldn't talk to you. Right. 
uh, more more on record of. How how did you go about, and where where is that line between fiction and and nonfiction for you? Well, it's very gray. Uh, Mm -hmm. I realized they had a conversation at the dinner table. Mm -hmm. Uh, This was Dorothy from her interview. Mm -hmm. And I realized they had a terrible falling out, so much so they weren't speaking for a while afterwards. And they wrote Mm -hmm. about it, they talked about it Mm -hmm. in in letters. Mm -hmm. Uh, It had to do with the father, uh, and well, it's a very long conversation right there, but it had to do with the family disagreement about what to do with one of the Mm -hmm. brothers. And uh, Jerry was furious at his father for a variety of reasons, Mm -hmm. which are all in the book. And uh, he said, old man, when you die, I'll come back here and piss on your grave. That level of anger came out. And that's a direct quote from what three or four people told me he actually said at that dinner table. Mm -hmm. And then the lead up to that was just a conversation, uh, probably a normal conversation about stuff. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is kind of what happened, maybe not directly, but then I would defy anybody who was there to do it much better. I mean, mean, you can't really recall (laughs) things very clearly. Memory is a very slippery uh, thing in our heads, right? Mm -hmm. It's not like you're just, I mean, it's Mm well-informed. Nonfiction mm-hmm. or fiction. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I always used to say I'll take fifty-one percent nonfiction, forty-nine percent fiction. <laughs> so what's true? What's the? I think it's a Jewish saying. What's truer than the truth? The story is truer. I mean, it's the story. Mm-hmm. So this is definitely not a not a work of fiction. No. At least that's what I'm going to declare. <laughs> but the uh, the real not. question I had, and this is where I struggled, right. is that how did he come to the decision to actually get a motorcycle, mm-hmm. take that? Right. Unregistered pistol, uh, revolver he found, right. and uh, and go back to Iowa and kill them. And I had him mm. on the plane back from Iowa, right. a dream, mm-hmm. and the dream puts him into a cornfield with a gelatinous blue mass, and then mm-hmm. he's frozen in ice up to his neck. That's Dante. Mm-hmm. Right. That's but where that's where right. killers of families are yeah. are placed in hell. They're placed in ice up to their neck. Right. But it, he's a hot guy. He's always mad about something. He's mm-hmm. red. You can see from the cover there's a redness to him, and it cools him down. The right. ice the, in the cor- mm-hmm. so it basically turns him into a cold person, which allows him to to commit the murder. I mean, this is all mm-hmm. sort of like psychological. Did right. something like this happen? Eh. Right. But something like this could have happened, right. and mm-hmm. something changed him from being a family member to someone who right. is thinking about doing away with his family. Exactly. And I don't know what it was, but it could have been something like that. Right, things weave in and out of fact and fiction for sure. And he's not going to tell us, so... uh, Well, it's a fine line every time, but Mm -hmm. that's why, I mean, that's why um, this is kind of a tangent, but I mean, Mm -hmm. a lot of the times people will say, you know, you get back back cover blurbs for books, and people will always claim that it's just your friends, but I always point out, actually, it's not. It's a really important part of doing a book, especially this book. I Mm -hmm. mean, we purposely picked out... um, people that had lived in that experience, uh, another author who writes this similar sort of genres mm-hmm. to make sure that it's, um, that it isn't just Scott getting too carried away and it obviously, people yeah. don't think that. And so, um, it's just, I mean, it's not like we just threw it out there without mm-hmm. thinking about it at all. Yeah. This has been, well, sure. everything's been thought out. Were there any lines that you drew for yourself that, 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 that you just didn't want to cross? Well, I had trouble with the sex. <laughs> mm-hmm. There was some specific sex in the in the, and I didn't want to invade their privacy, Georgine and, right. and Les. There, there are things that I knew that it just weren't. It really are nobody's business. One of the lawyers mm-hmm. who was actually uh, involved in the case said, "They've been invaded enough. Uh, yeah. Leave them be." So this has turned into much less of a. It could have been a lot more graphic. There mm-hmm. just are places that are none of my business and none of anybody's right. business. It wasn't necessarily brought up. It was part of the autopsy. Mm-hmm. And right. I just, I thought, this is, I don't want to show this. I don't right. want to get into it. And it doesn't change yeah. what happened at all. No, right. not at all. No. Right, right, right. I'm just, yeah. Mm-hmm. Huh. Well, um, what was I thinking? Um, I know that I had, I've known some people that have lived in Cedar mm-hmm. Falls at the time and have read it. And it is tricky to figure it all out because they'll say, you know, I, I'll read the book, and I, there's times when I think maybe Jerry is innocent. But when you're done, you realize there's no way. I mean, you put everything together. Just If you put it together as a whole, but maybe if you pick each little individual thing, you can maybe debate one thing or another. But it's fascinating, the string of Well, there are always evidence. discrepancies in a right. trial. There's technical mm-hmm. problems. Right. And then there's issues with eyewitnesses who are sort mm-hmm. of like, well, if you saw him, how could he have done the murder? Which is true. Right. That's true. Uh, and there were some issues with DNA and uh, mm-hmm. blood, blood, blood type testing. But not enough to outweigh Absolutely the not. huge evidence. This is what right. the three-judge panel... Mm-hmm 
who heard George O'Brien's uh, case right. said, he said, there are, there are discrepancies, but during a trial, the big right. evidence is still right. going to be presented and it can't be refuted. Right. If he had been able to refute it, he might have had a chance, but there was no right. refutation. So many coincidences, because I know when I read it the first time, <laughs> it was the phone calls, you know, but it turns out they saved the, um, what we, they call phone it? Phone records, yeah, the phone cards, cards, computer calls, cards, yeah. Right? And they, those were going to be um, destroyed shortly after. Yep. Mm -hmm. They right. found them just in time, and you can just like plot. Yep. It's like you can't say you're over here when the phone calls keep getting no. closer exactly. to where you say you're right. not going. Yeah. And, so and then buying those odd 38 long cold cartridges right. and signing for them. Exactly. Social right. security number, and that pistol fired 30. Right. Hardly yeah. any other pistol 38 would fire those <laughs> exactly. uh, cartridges. They're and the very guy remembered odd him caliber because right? he bought them from a guy who was from Iowa. <laughs> yeah. I mean. Just right. things like that, you know. Yeah. They wouldn't forget. It wouldn't just be, oh, I kind of remember that guy. Yeah. No, we had a yeah. like a conversation mm -hmm. about Iowa when you yeah. were buying this. He stuff. was from Waterloo, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, yeah. yeah, everything is just lined up just like that. Yeah, yeah. I, it's it's mm -hmm. a really it's really interesting to sort of see how all those those coincidences sort of build up into mm -hmm. into a larger uh, right. a larger case. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, one thing that strikes me about a lot of nonfiction is that um, it's written by people from outside of that community, yeah. right? It's somebody going and, oh, I'm mm -hmm. gonna go write a book mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. orchid thieves or, right. or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, <laughs> you're good. not an outsider. No. Um, what kind sure. of response, how, is it, how did that change how you had to approach it? And how did that change the response <laughs> that, that, that you were privy to? Well, I've lived in Cedar Falls all my life. I'm mm -hmm. a native, and just mm -hmm. like Jerry, and it gives me a kind of in, in a way. Mm -hmm. I think it's an advantage because I understand the community. I certainly understand and experienced the shock there's a double shock, the shock of the murders, right. and then the shock of the arrest. The conviction was a bit of a shock too, I must mm -hmm. say. Mm -hmm. So I'm part of the scene in a way, and I think that's an advantage. Had an outsider come in, I think there wouldn't have been much empathy for, well, it's a small town, it's just a place where people were shocked, big deal. Right. Well, it was visceral. This is a visceral mm -hmm. case. And every time I've talked on it, big crowds show up because they have the same gut reaction. Mm -hmm. This is a right. this whole crime and the arrest and conviction was a punch in the gut to this town. Yeah, right. it's almost a comment on how could we raise someone like this? I mean, and I right, like, and I wondered that myself. Right, it, I mean, you don't people like purpose, this are not supposed to come from these little Edens yeah, on the prairie, right. you know? Sure. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I know. It's well, people are really interested in it. Yeah. It's obvious so far. It's yeah. only been out a couple of weeks mm -hmm. now, and it's flowing off the shelves. Yeah, really fast. And where where can people go go to get a copy? If they oh, want? anywhere, um, Cedar Falls especially, and, um, and then there's various other signings here and there around it. And Amazon, I believe, and Kindle. Amazon and Barnes and Noble and Kindle. Kindles. By the time you see this, we'll have uh, e-readers for it, e-books for it. I know. You're right. <laughs> Good thing you didn't watch me two shows ago, but I've been convinced. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, uh, and uh, Prairie Lights in Iowa City, just all throughout. Great. It's just, you know, it's like all the books. It's got ISBN number. It's available everywhere you go and ask. And you yep. can check it out on uh, the Ice Cube Press website and order right there with your credit card as well. All right. Well, fantastic. Thank you so much for coming down and joining us, Thank you, Scott. Alex. Um, thank you guys for mm -hmm. watching. Um, and join us in another few months and for the uh, Tall Corn right. Book Talk. Until next time, us, guys. keep your pages turning and your uh, bookmarks well placed. <laughs> Thanks, guys.